This morning's reading is from John 10, verses 1 through 10. The truth of the matter is, whoever doesn't enter the sheepfold through the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep, the one for whom uh, the keeper opens the gate. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. The shepherd calls them by name and leads them out. Having led them all out of the fold, the shepherd walks in front of them and they follow because they recognize the shepherd's voice. They simply won't follow strangers. They'll flee from them because they don't recognize the voice of strangers. Even though Jesus used this metaphor with them, they didn't grasp what he was trying to tell them. He therefore said to them again, the truth of the matter is, I am the sheep gate. All who come before me were thieves and marauders whom the sheep didn't heed. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be safe. You'll go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and slaughter and destroy. I came that you might have life and have it to the full. Ancient words for our present day consideration. Well, thank you all for being here as we're trying to rebuild after COVID. It's like every, every person is so, we're, we're grateful for everybody that makes the trip. So thank you. And we're <clears throat> at the beginning of a series. It's going to take a while since I'm not getting writing leave again this year um, for good reasons, because we're, we're rebuilding right now. Last year, it was the Republicans. Um, the year before that, it was, I mean, but that typically, I like, I take my writing leave in July, which is special session, um, and they're always hunting for somebody. So, um, so I'm gonna, what I'm going to try to do is, is do sermons and classes on sort of the topics of the book that I've been writing on forever, and hopefully to start kind of pulling something together. Um, yeah, no rush, no rush. Um, and, and I want it to be something, hopefully, that will be helpful to you, um, not just talking about religion, but talking about life. You know, we're asking the question today, religion, who needs it? Um, and I would imagine that's a question that many people ask. When I got to, to college, I was preparing to study all the world religions and see which one worked best for me, but I, I wasn't prepared for that question which professors ask us, why are you religious at all? And, you know, we, we studied that first year was like a dip in acid because we, you know, the uh, Freud saying it's a childhood neuroses, Bertrand Russell saying it's uh, born of fear. Um, Mark saying it was the opium of the people. Some of the, the new atheists even say it and more harshly, Steven Weinberg says, with or without religion, you would have good people doing good things and evil people doing evil things. But for good people to do evil things, that takes religion. Now, I don't agree with that 100%, but I agree with it some percent. Right? That when we look at the situation of the world today, the way America practices religion is a huge part of the problem that we're facing. And this goes way back. Mark Twain, another thing I ran across when I got to college was uh, letters from the earth or letters to the earth. His uh, sort of attack on religion. And Mark Twain, I always thought, of, you know, just really nice guy kind of stuff. Uh, but, but he didn't like religion very much. He said, the church has opposed every innovation and discovery from the day Galileo, of Galileo to our own time, when the use of anesthetics in childbirth was regarded as a sin because it avoided the biblical curse pronounced against Eve. And I studied that, that there were people from the church that said that women shouldn't have anesthesia 
because the Bible says women should suffer in childbirth. Um, I mean, he has some good points here. Uh, he also said there was no place in the land where the seeker could not find some small budding sign of pity for the slave as the nation started waking up to slavery. He said no place in all the land but one, the pulpit. It yielded last, it always does. It fought a strong and stubborn fight, and then it did what it always does, joined the procession at the tail end. Slavery fell, the slavery text of the Bible remained, the practice changed, that was all. Could we do the first slide, please? When I was a kid, one of the reasons that was given for being religion, at least as a Christian, was so that you wouldn't go to that place. And I'll admit it looks a little unpleasant. Uh, it's, I'm blanking on Hieronymus. Is that right? Did I say that right? Hieronymus Bosch. He loved drawing hell. Uh, and as a kid, I just was fascinated by all the little characters uh, that he has. But what kind of a product needs a threat like that to sell it? You know what I'm saying? What kind of a religion is only appealing if that's the alternative? And there are many world religions that have some kind of horrific possibility, um, you know, a karmic wheel of sorrow if you don't, the enlightenment, uh, continual rebirth, this kind of thing. So today we're asking, is there a product called religion that doesn't need this kind of bullying and threat? Who, who needs it? Who needs religion? What I'm going to suggest is that for Jesus, religion wasn't really a need. It was an aspiration. So you don't see him. I mean, he talks about hell because people believed in hell. He had to talk about the the imagery of the time. But the axle around which his movement rotated was love, compassion, hope, not fear and hell. And I believe when the religion made that transition and started using the energy of fear, it already aligned itself to cruelty. And I think that, that we can see historically the, the, the truth of that. Um, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I think there is a, an understanding of religion. I 100% understand people who don't like religion. I got it. One of the things that took me so long to go into the ministry was I was humiliated to tell my friends um, that I was going to be a minister because uh, my own view is so low. Uh, you know, you think of somebody who's kind of escapist, kind of a second or third rate thinker. Um, but something happened to me in my training where I worked with people when they were dying. And I realized these were people who needed religion to cross a bridge, to get in touch with something. It wasn't, the, it, they, it wasn't literal necessarily. But I realized that just because I left religion would not mean that religion would leave people alone. Right? It's still going to be there because religion is a topic. It's like politics. If somebody says, I don't like politics, I don't want to get involved in politics. Well, that doesn't mean politics are going to leave you alone. Right? There's a rabbinical saying, if there are two people in the room, there's politics. <laughs> I would suggest if there's one person in the room, there's religion. Right, because none of us can untether from our mammal, animal, irrational core and become this pure reason. And in many ways, we're safer, or other people are safer from us, if we realize, we have the humility to realize that, that we struggle towards compassion and rationality. But that's not our default. And what religion can be is what Buddha called skillful means to stay in touch 
with our best selves in times when we're tempted to be shut down. Okay, so we're going to be looking at a story uh, that Jesus taught. And uh, please go to the next one. <coughs> Jesus is the guy with the little glowing head. And this is all historical. Uh, so <laughs> you'd think more people would believe him if his head glowed. You would think. Actually, my belief from studying the ancient uh, things was the halo is a symbol of the kind of cosmic being. That if it's, if it's gold, it's the sun. If it's silver, it's the moon. And those are different kinds of truth kind of thing. But what it's saying is the message this person is bringing is bigger than just the topic of religion or politics or life. It's, it's cosmic kind of thing. So they told a story about a man who had been born blind. And Jesus does the healing. And the religious people get furious. Now, that, that's a theme in, in the Christian story. Where priests, preachers, our type of ilk, are kind of the problem. Right? People that are seeking for meaning for love, no matter how wounded they are, can be headed in the right direction. But sort of the guardians of the kingdom, the people that speak for God, are given villain roles in the, in the Christian story. Not because clergy are all bad. There are three or four of us that are But our role is problematic by definition, right? When somebody's sitting in this role, standing in this place, uh, there's danger. Like they should always hear something shouting in their ear, danger, danger, danger. If I thought that you would take what I say uncritically, I would never come up here, right? I know that you're mature enough to say, okay, that works, that doesn't work. That's, that's a helpful insight. That's a crock. Because that way, I mean, we're on the same level. We're, we're, we're struggling, as every human being does, to, to see a little bit further, to feel a little bit deeper. Now, the problem was not the physical disability that the person had. First of all, I don't, confession, I don't take any part of the Bible literally. Maybe some of the justice stuff. I see it all as, as poetry. All of it is parable. particularly like the healing lessons, a lot of them come from earlier religions. You know, the stories that the hearer would say, okay, yeah, that's, that's that religion, that's that, that religion. But in this case, the lack of, 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 of being able to see is not about earthly vision. Helen Keller used to say that, uh, said the, uh, like the worst kind of blindness is basically having eyes but no vision having physical vision, but not realizing that other people are your human family. She said, the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. So this, this view of hell, I don't believe is a place but I believe a lot of us spend some time there. One uh, poet said that hell is wherever there isn't love. And we find ourselves there, right? We find ourselves in this, you know, restricted place where we feel like it's us against the world. And it's not, we're not really choosing. It's more like something we slide into and we wake up and we can't remember our own kindness. We can't remember our own hopes. Religion is a stepladder, or at least it should be a stepladder to the parts of ourselves that we lose sometimes. Uh, next picture. The scripture says this is an allegory, which is a good thing because putting a sheep on your shoulder with a white robe um, 
isn't thinking very far down the road. Sheep are not housebroken. Um, so it's a symbol. And I think there's a psychological component to it. That when we read these stories, the idea was to understand ourselves better. Not just to believe something that may or may not be true. But I think Christ represents your greatest self. The wisdom that's kind of written in your body because you're part of the cosmos. Your capacity to do do, uh, mathematics and art come from a very deep, creative place. The sheep represents the part of yourself that kind of runs off into the disaster. That it's, this isn't saying that I'm a shepherd and you're sheep. Right? I wouldn't accept that and you wouldn't either. It's talking about all of us. There are times when we're sort of the shepherd of our lives. We're at the steering wheel, and the other times when we are just running off the cliff. And again, it's not something we choose to do. That religion has to help us uh, get back to full capacity. But religion is always the lamp. It's never the flame. Right? Whatever we mean by the word spiritual, that's the flame. And religion does not give that to you. What religion does is give you disciplines and practices and a community to kind of protect that flame, to watch each other's back, to help each other when we're off balance. If you remember my good self, when all I can feel is my bad self, you can be a healer simply in your response. I believe that's what these stories are are trying to to share with us. And if there were a hell, I would leave the church. I I found out there's literally a hell. I would never spend eternity with the torturer. I mean, the idea of an eternal hell is stupid. And I don't use that word very often. My mother always said, don't use the word. But the idea of hell, like eternal punishment after you're dead... And there's no way you can learn from it and get out of it. That's a very, very stupid idea. And it does untold damage on the people that believe it. Because that fear shuts good people down. And that's that's something I agree with the astrophysicist. I think there are other things that can make a good person do bad things. Love, you know, romance, ambition. Um, politics. There's all kinds of things that can make us wander off of our true self. But one of them is religion that's based on fear or superstition. So, Emerson used to say, uh, where is it? Religion is to do right It is to love, it is to serve, it is to think, it is to be humble. And we all intend that, but something happens within us to keep that from always being. Hell is that horrible place where we're stuck sometimes within ourselves. Uh, One poet said that we're punished by our sins, not for our sins. So hell is a symbol of the misery of a loveless life, of feeling you're on your own, not feeling your connections with anybody else, not able to to empathize with others because you're so afraid and shut down. But there's also an equal and opposite truth that if you try to live in reason all the time, if you try to be whole and enlightened all the time, there's a different kind of insanity because we can't do that. All of those little quirks, the instincts, the the emotions, even the childish ones, are what make life worth living. Reason does not lead us to value. Value is something you feel. No matter how much you believe in justice, if you don't empathize with other people, you're talking about something else. 
Justice is what reason does to empathy. It, it makes it universal, but it has to start with the flesh and blood feelings. And sometimes to get in touch with those feelings, you have to come off balance, right? You have to go on a little journey inside. You have to go crazy sometimes a little bit. Um, and if we don't, if we think we're speaking for God as human beings, no matter how religious we are, we've entered insanity. And so in the stories, the priests and preachers are the villains. I can live with that. I'm sure you're fine with that too. Uh, the early church founder, uh, John Chrysostom, St. John Chrysostom, uh, used to say the road to hell is paved with the skulls of clergy. I don't even know what that means, but I agree. I mean, hopefully not my skull, but if that's all I am, if clergy dumb becomes a role that I'm playing, then there's a pathology there, right? Because I'm the same little mammal you are, doing the best I can. I'm playing a role within the community, but there is no, there is no elevation beyond ordinary humanity. Like that's as high as it gets for any of us. And try to go beyond that makes it worse. Um, I love that Jesus says that the good shepherd calls the sheep by their name. And that's, that's saying that universality cannot erase your individuality. Right? Unity means nothing if we're not seeing the individuals. Right? People who say, I don't see race. Or I love everybody. It's like, if you don't see certain things, you're just not seeing the minefield somebody else has to walk through. Right? So that type of love is close to worthless. It's just so generic. It never really lands anywhere. It's a beautiful bird with no feet to land. So uh, I love a song by Jackson Brown. Uh, on finding ourselves. It says, throw down your truth and check your weapons. Don't look to see if you're alone. Just stand your ground. Don't turn around whatever happens. Don't ask directions. The next voice you hear will be your own. I think that's what Jesus is pointing to here. But he talks about calling the name of the sheep. It's hearing your own voice. And most churches shut that down. But you go to confirmation class and they fill your head with answers to questions you weren't asking. Instead of listening for your unique voice and applauding that. That's what we can do for each other that sometimes we can't do for ourselves. We've all found somebody who sees something great within us at times when we can't feel that. And that's something that a community can do that we can't do alone. So there, there are two, it's like, it, it's like bowling. It's like there's two gutters and you, either one is, doesn't count, give you any points. What is the balance? That's what we're talking about here. Uh, could we see next? <clears throat> um, religion needs to be able to fold down to the level where we feel safe when we're at our worst and most vulnerable. The symbols have to work at a childlike level so that even when we're shut down, we can hear something stirring. So Jesus said, I'm like the gate, right? This isn't the chosen sheep of the universe. And the church may have said that. But what the, the parable is saying is that it protects people when they're caved in on themselves. It also opens where they go in and out. It's like a nest for a bird when it's developing its wings. But it also opens to the whole sky. And religion has to do both of those. So this idea of the gate that you go in and out, there's also, I like the idea of the umbrella where you close and you're just an individual but when you open it, you're the universe kind of thing. What is our next? 
I mean, how many times does Jesus talk about things like birds and flowers so that we feel the life within us? That's such an important starting place. He says, I've come that you might have life. Religion isn't a need, but neither is art. Art's an aspiration. We're more human if we create. Kindness is not a need. It's a calling to our greatness. That's what it is. So Jesus talks about the life within us. And then the next one, Pentecost. Which is why I wore the red tie. Um, I don't wear ties very often, but it was the only red thing in my office. So, And I knew the worship team would. I won't say what would have happened, but um, this is another it's Pentecost. Um, I had to go looking for this, and some people were helpful. But what that symbol of the flame, the tongues of flame, um, you find it in Stoicism, you find it in Hinduism. And the meaning of it is this. <clears throat> um, I, think, I hope this isn't a bad idea. When you look at like a campfire and you have like this big fire, but you have these little tongues that come out. They're also called swords sometimes. I can't really do it. Something like that. But that idea of individuals and unity. When you think of that image of the, um, the gate, if you think of an organic being, that's what an organic being is. But it has to have some kind of a boundary in order to survive, but it has to open up to its environment. The flame represents both unity and the individuality of, of the people. But what's so ironic is it looks like hell. Doesn't it? I mean, it's fire. So in a sense... Hell is when we say no to change. When we meet, when we greet change with fear, it feels like hell. And when we say yes to it, when we give our individuality back to the whole and realize that's, you know, all the toys go back in the box. Right? We're individuals, but we're one thing as well. That's a blissful thought. But everything depends on your inner state. There's Milton that said, the mind is its own place. It can make a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven, depending on what you're doing. I think that's what Jesus is talking about. I don't think he's trying to threaten us. I don't think try, he's not trying to make us dependent. But to realize we shut down sometimes. And religion is the art of going into somebody else's nightmare and helping them out of it. I learned that in, in the chaplaincy thing. It doesn't matter what's logical. If somebody is in terror and I can't enter their world with them as they're experiencing it, then I cannot help them. But part of religion is the skill set of entering into other people's worldviews without getting stuck there. So Pentecost is the celebration of the unity and the diversity. It's also the symbol of this gate where the, the, the sheep go in and out. For the next few months, we're going to be asking the questions of, of religion. And one of the questions I hope that you'll ask honestly is, do I really need religion? And I hope that the answer will be no. No, I don't, I'm not afraid of going to hell if I'm not religious. I'm not afraid of getting stuck in a rebirth of karma. But my life would be so much richer if I gave it to love. My life would be so much richer if I got serious about the disciplines of my spiritual life. My life would be so much richer if I shared with others and cared about their journey, particularly young people. 
if I, if I, I share my experience with people who are still trying to figure out what the world is in the first place so they don't have to make all of the same mistakes, not to get them to try to live in our worldview, but to share with them the exciting journey of being alive uh, in, in the world and in the cosmos. One type of imbalance is, is when we can't see the whole. Another type of imbalance is, is where we don't know who we are. We know everything else. We've memorized all of the answers, but we don't know who we are as human beings. Religion is the marriage of those two factors. Healthy religion. Yes. If you're hurt and wounded, it needs to be a, a tender nest for a wounded bird. But when you're strong, it needs to let go and trust your wings into this vast sky. Well, those are my struggles with the text. That's the best I can do. Uh, but we set aside a minute for you to think and uh, how you would understand these words. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>